Welcome everyone to the first season of the FIP Chief Executive Officers interviews. Thanks so much, Bob, for making time for us in your busy agenda, especially during these strange COVID times we're living in. I wanted to welcome you on uh, season one of these interviews. These seasons comprise 10 interviews, which I'm running with global leaders and colleagues in pharmacy and healthcare, where we seek to explore your journey, your experiences, and the impact of those experiences on your professional practice. I was inspired to start these discussions after our conversation with FIP President Dominique Jordan, where we discussed the development of a vaccine and treatments for COVID-19 with Professor Trevor Jones. And he walked us through his experiences with AZT in the 80s and 90s and how invaluable those lessons have been for now. This inspired me and I reflected on how important it is for our pharmacy leaders to be able to share those insights, to be able to share the experiences when things go well, and dare I say it, when they don't quite go to plan, so that we can learn from such experiences with you. So I'm so proud to interview you today, Bob. Can't wait to share some of those insights with the profession. Maybe for me, get some life lessons too. Welcome, Bob. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the kind uh, invitation to be part of this, uh, what seems to be a very interesting and exciting endeavor. Thank you so much, Bob. So let's move on to the first questions. There'll be a lot of discussions around your biography um, and your journey through your career, Bob, which we'll walk us through. Um, and I note that you attended University of Iowa, where you completed an MSc and a PhD in medicinal chemistry and natural products, subjects uh, after my heart. But I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your childhood, uh, your background, and where your inspirations for choosing your career came from, Bob. Sure. Well, I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, in the USA. Uh, at that time, in the 1950s, uh, my parents uh, lived in a house about eight blocks away from Midway Airport. And at that time, Midway Airport was the busiest airport in the world. So one grows up in this big city. Chicago, at that time, also was the second largest city in, in the U.S. It also had, during my uh, youth uh, and uh, uh, early teen years, uh, three of the five tallest buildings in the world, including the tallest building in the world. So it was an interesting place to grow up, but it had all the challenges that a big city has. And uh, I think that probably shaped a lot of, of, of my early life, uh, everything from Chicago sports to uh, the challenges of living in a big city. Uh, then uh, uh, we were very fortunate because both my maternal and paternal grandparents uh, lived around where we did. And so it was a close family. When my grandfather passed away when I was in sixth grade, uh, my grandmother uh, decided to move in with my aunt and my uh, father went to uh, his, his mother's house, uh, my grandmother's house, and was cleaning out her basement as they were getting ready to sell the house. And I was always interested in science. I loved to read about science. It was at a time where the big news were the astro U.S. Astro seven astronauts, the Mercury astronauts, and I loved science and every, every aspect of it and just constantly read around science. And as we were going through the basement and kind of moving boxes and opening up boxes to see what they were after all these years, we ran into a set of boxes that had beakers and flask and all these chemicals. And it turned out it was the chemistry set my father had when he was growing up. Uh, he uh, left uh, for World War II in the Navy uh, when he was 17 and uh, never continued with his interest around science and, and chemistry. <clears throat> but we took those to our house and put them in the basement. And from that point on, I started to read a lot about chemistry. And probably uh, to the detriment of our home, I would go down in the basement as I'd read about things and I'd do these experiments and all sorts of things. I'm really surprised I didn't blow up the house or at least burn it down. And uh, needless to say, I never let my children play with chemicals like I did at that time. <laughs> I have to say my interest in chemistry really grew out of that. I ended up taking two courses in chemistry in high school, uh, went to a university where I was promised to be able to do re research from the day I stepped uh, on campus. And as part of that, I did, and I worked with the chair of the department, and he had me start to read something that was called the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry. 
And from that point on, I fell in love with that field. And uh, it's been part of my life ever since. It's so funny, isn't it, when we think back to certain events in our lives and then see how they've run like a golden thread through all of the big decisions we've made. And that definitely sounds like it. I'm also giggling to myself, Bob, that whilst it was fine for you to play in the basement of your home, <laughs> you perhaps discouraged your children from doing so as well. So that might have been a, a wisdom that played with you. Um, so big city living, uh, big city challenges, but also exciting. And then finding a bit of legacy from your father um, who left the Navy at 17, maybe we'll touch on that again, um, really started off a career that is super notable. Yeah. Thank you very My much. My interaction with pharmacy actually was because of that. I remember going down to the Rexall drugstore that was a few blocks away uh, because the pharmacist would sell me some chemicals that they had that I could use in these experiments I was doing. And uh, it's interesting how life has changed around that, but it was it really gave one a chance to kind of explore in a way that, you know, just really drove my interest in sciences. It was great, actually. Yeah, it fosters a real experimental part of a brain, I think. And, and we're very, very concerned about health and safety these days, rightly so. But it is interesting, isn't it, how um, yeah. these foster some, some sparks of, of interest in a young person. Really good. I should tell you, though, it's rather interesting that... Uh, as a parent uh, uh, with our three children, uh, Arlene and I and the three kids were with grandpa and grandma at my mom and dad's house one time. And uh, they were probably, I don't know, 12, 10 and eight at the time. And we were talking about something and, and about how bad they, they saw an advertisement or something on TV about not smoking. And I said, I was always glad I didn't smoke. And my mother said, now don't lie to your children. You used to go down in that basement and smoke. And I said, mom, I've never smoked. You just have no idea what experiments I used to do down there. <laughs> you were glad that she thought you were smoking rather than yeah, yeah, really she doing. Yeah, what I was doing. She probably would have never yeah. gone out of my bedroom again. And that's also so interesting, isn't it? You know, what will be the public health? Probably sugar will be the public health toxin in the next uh, 20 years. If you think about even in lab work, how many professors used to smoke while teaching chemistry, for example. Yeah. It's yeah. very interesting. So Bob, we'll move on. Um, when I read your biography, I mean, I know quite a lot about you having uh, known you and worked with you, even from afar for a couple of years, but it's so impressive and full of achievements and leadership and teamwork and invention. The chairmanship, your movement through different positions um, is really something to behold. You're currently Professor and Dean Emeritus of the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at University of British Columbia. And you are chair of the FIP Global Pharmaceutical of observatory advisory committee which we're reforming alongside a new vision for the observatory and FIP. This question doesn't really focus on the successes it really focuses on what do you consider to be the three biggest lessons from your career? Well as I think about it maybe there's a couple things there's something I, I say to everybody I hire okay I've said to my children and to my grandchildren but to everybody I hire to all the students that I that I have a chance to mentor and talk about. And one of them is, remember that it's a great day if you learn something. Thus, try to learn something new and important each and every day, and then you have a great day every day. And I, I believe that to be true to this day. The second thing maybe, if I think about it, yeah, I think the sooner you realize that you don't possess all of the great ideas, all of the great answers, and you learn how and when to ask for guidance, then the sooner and the more successful you'll be. And I think that's really true. And the third thing maybe, since you asked for three, I'm gonna use something that uh, somebody else had told me. And uh, I've really had the honor, I've served as a department chair for over a decade. I've been a dean at two different universities in two different countries. And certainly one of the questions that comes up and I've been asked before by a number of people is if you've been in leadership for a while, when do you know it's the right time to step down from the leadership position? And uh, really a wonderful mentor to me and certainly a visionary pharmacy uh, educator was uh, Jordan Cohen. He, as I said, was a tremendous mentor to me as I was doing more and more administrative things. Uh, he's the former Dean at the uh, Faculty of Pharmacy or at School of Pharmacy at the University of Kentucky and also was the Dean uh, of Pharmacy at the University of Iowa, not when I was there, but after that. 
And he told me something that a colleague told him about leadership. And he said, when the ten, you know when it's time to step out of your leadership role, when 10% of the people that never supported you in that leadership role starts to influence the 50% of your team that have never made up their minds. And I have to be honest with you, there is a lot of truth to that concept. It, it really it's is. It's such a You're top tip. To, that's right. You're always going to win some people over yeah. uh, for all sorts of good reasons and maybe others. And there's going to be some that are always going to be apprehensive. And then there's that group that tends to sit in the middle, which is bigger. Okay. And uh, <laughs> when that group that's unhappy starts to influence the rest of that group, you know it's time. Yes. And, and that comes a little bit with, um, Bob, the wisdom of not expecting everybody to like what you do all the time, to just understand it's the law of averages. Some people just won't. But that's such a top tip. I've, I've written that one down. I'm going to nick that one from you i'm afraid bob but with yeah. pride and uh, what a great set of uh, lessons that you are sharing with us it's great so bob we i noticed that um some of your notable achievements that i can pick up when you served as dean at ubc you're instrumental in the fundraising design and building uh, that has won numerous awards for design functionality and innovation You've taught in professional graduate curriculum. You've served on scientific advisory and editorial boards. You're a founder of the Center for Drug Research and Development, a national not-for-profit drug development and commercialization center that provides expertise and infrastructure to enable researchers to advance promising early stage drug candidates, never more needed than at this time, Bob. And in these various roles, you have and you continue to contribute to research, health policy, team building, international partnerships, and as I know uh, very well, to strategic innovations. But Bob, it's always interesting to me to kind of uncover, unpick the three biggest achievements that you would note down. Yeah, it, it's interesting, uh, that question, because sometimes uh, to say that about yourself, okay, is sometimes hard to do. So I have to be honest with you, since you had said to me that one of the things you wanted to, me to talk about was what I thought were my most important achievements, I actually asked my wife, Arlene, what do you think they were? And uh, I was struck by what she, the ones she said, the, the three she said. And I think there's real truth to that. And they all touch upon things that I would have said, but maybe from a slightly different perspective. So one of them was when I served as the interim uh, pharmacy deanship uh, at the University of Mississippi. It was a rather interesting time. It was 1999, and it was right before the Christmas holidays started at the university, and the university decided to make a change in leadership. There were a number, the faculty had a pharmacy at the University of Mississippi had really moved forward fairly aggressively in moving the role of clinical pharmacy and a number of things. But this, as, as right as it probably was, and how aggressive it was, it had really created uh, difficulties with the university, with alumni, even the, board, uh, the state board of pharmacy was concerned. And, and there were just real challenges and frustrations. And the university decided to make a change in leadership. And I was asked to step in for that. So here we were going to go ahead and search for a new dean. And I agreed to step in. But I also said that I would only serve in the interim role. I ended up doing that for 18 months and really kind of uh, preparing the environment and building back the momentum in the school uh, to be able to hire a new dean. Matter of fact, I even sat on the search committee for the new dean, uh, which gave the faculty a great deal of uh, assurance that I was serious about this idea because I was approached by five out of the six department chairs asking, would I throw my hat in for the deanship? And I said, no. I had accepted this and had told the faculty I would do this to serve as interim. And I thought that was important and that we should have an appropriate search process and I would not be part of that. And so I was really proud of that because when we were done, I think we were in a good place. I think all the key stakeholders felt good about it. The new Dean uh, felt great about coming in and the nature of where we were. And to this day, we're great friends, the, the Dean that came in after my interim deanship. And matter of fact, even the State Board of Pharmacy awarded me an honorary State of Mississippi pharmacist license so I could practice in the state. Even though as a medicinal chemist, I would never do anything to harm the public and do that. 
So I felt good about that. And, and that certainly is, I think, one of the important achievements that I've had and been blessed with. I think maybe the second one is what you had talked about a little bit was the concept of building this new state-of-the-art uh, facility. But that really isn't the accomplishment. Uh, we set out and created a big vision of what pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences could be in the province, in the country, and, from a, and be impactful from a more worldwide perspective. And as part of that, uh, early on in my deanship at the University of British Columbia, okay, I would go out and visit stakeholders, but I started to go out and visit as many pharmacies, hospital pharmacies, community pharmacies, specialty practices around the province. And indeed, over that time, I visited well over 500 pharmacies. Uh, the relatively new dean of medicine who came in after I did called me up and said he had something urgent to talk about. And I thought maybe there was some problem between the two schools or faculties. And he said, no, what he wanted me to do was to stop going and visiting pharmacies because the Minister of Health for B British Columbia had said, if I can go visit all the pharmacies, why can't he visit all the physicians? So we really built mm -hmm. a case in the province for how important pharmacy education and pharmaceutical sciences were but that this had to change. And the nature of what we did and what we contributed to the province was different. So we did build a building, it was a $155 million facility uh, at a time when the Canadian dollar was almost a parity with the US dollar. And it was selected soon after its opening as the top academic building in Canada. Uh, with that said though, it was never a physical facility, it was everything that went with it. We had broad support for this big vision, uh, it uh, really was the greater engagement and alignment of the faculty with the new needs and challenges of the B B BC healthcare system. It was embedding faculty members in rural sites across British Columbia. It was demonstrating new roles for pharmacists. We actually had the first pharmacy in the province that had no medicines involved, we even had to change the Practice Act because that's part of what defined a pharmacy is you had medicines on site and we didn't. Uh, but really it was using uh, solely the uh, cognitive skills of a pharmacist to benefit a patient. And there were a number of other innovations, including you'd mentioned the Center for Drug Research and Development that we raised probably close to $200 million and created what became the Canadian model for translating academic discovery into innovative health products. But with all of that, suddenly pharmacy, pharmaceutical sciences at the University of British Columbia became intertwined with all of those things in that province. And it changed the way we were looked at. And so uh, certainly past my time as Dean, uh, fairly recently, the province of British Columbia really put in tens of millions of dollars into the faculty to actually now embed across every region in the province, faculty uh, practitioners with skills uh, that are sufficient to be on an academic faculty to be able to provide cognitive services to groups of physicians around the province. And that wouldn't have happened unless all those other changes hadn't occurred. So it's this great physical facility, but it really was everything. It was the bigger piece. And I'm very proud of that too, as an achievement. And I think the third thing, and uh, certainly uh, I won't describe it in detail, but it was really helping to create a greater international presence for the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at UBC. The university is consistently listed in various rankings as one of the top 50 universities in the world. But our faculty was really only involved internationally via individual relationships and projects. And those were great, but didn't really have a bigger presence as an organization. And I believe we really expanded that exponentially and continue to do so in a way that really builds upon our impact and our recognition. And so, uh, and uh, we now touch on and do things on six different continents. So I'm really proud of that also as an achievement. You should be, Bob. I think it's very interesting <clears throat> that you got Arlene to help reflect back. I, I, I understand completely. A CV is factual, but being asked to pick your three biggest achievements can be really tough. And it's nice to have somebody who you knows on your side pick them. What I've noted um, along each of these is the fact that you're very, very passionate about setting the scene and making sure that the environment is right. You've, you've said that about the appointment of the Dean in Mississippi, that 
you know, you wanted to make yeah. things right for the new dean to come into post. And, and being very explicit about your role as interim helped with that. And then your passion for talking about the building, you're right, it's a physical facility, but it's actually, look at what, what came in to that and came out of that. Uh, the concept was as important as the bricks and mortar. And then look at what's been delivered through that translating yeah. your innovations into patient care so i see and i hear a man who really cares about the environment and getting things right in terms of engagement as much as the bricks and mortar and then finally that bit of international from the bricks of international achievement through to the six continents of international impact i think really says a lot as well bob so some um golden threads emerging here as well you're very keen on getting the relationships right it's lovely yeah. to hear I don't know if that reflects back, but you think? I also think that uh, it's important to really engage your community. One of the things this fabulous building did, and part of the reason why it won so many awards, imagine if you had giant iPads on the wall. These would be the equivalent of taking, uh, say, maybe six large screen TVs and putting them together as one unit on a wall. And we actually uh, raised, I raised funds and, and uh, worked with programmers. and so. We have one that basically is the journey of a drug. So in other words, you go up there and you pick, you want to have a man or a woman, adult or a child. Then you pick one of six categories of drugs and the route of administration. It lights up a, 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 a sort of a silhouette of a body as to where this is going to happen. And then it goes through phases very visually of what happens and then poses or tells you details about it, which you can click on. There's another one that has a group of about 10 of real stories of our alumni. And you can click on that individual. One would have been early on in the history of the, of the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at UBC. And it would tell you what a pharmacist used to do basically 50, 60 years ago. Okay, it ends with an individual a woman that when you touch on her uh, hand, suddenly a DNA molecule appears as if it's a hologram. And she talks about where the future of pharmaceutical sciences and pharmacy are going. But everyone in between is a real story about a real alumnus and what they do. And people can learn about that. But we invite the community in. And that building was always open so people could come in. And I've seen parents and grandparents with young children come in and play with those walls. We also have one on the uh, uh, six drugs that changed the world. And you can go ahead and touch on those and it tells you all sorts of stories about them. But it suddenly makes pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences and what we do much more important to how it touches the average individual's lives. A little bit like the, um, you finding the uh, beakers in the basement story. It brings yeah. it to life, doesn't it? And, and this so idea that parents better. and grandparents can play with the walls. Really, Bob, I think this is it, isn't it? It's about how do you make things real for people? I'm really yeah. hearing that from you. And Wonderful. I must say, too, it's been tr tremendous to attract people into the building in the sense that I'll get a, I would get a call as a dean saying that the minister of such and such, either from British Columbia or from Can or Canada as a, as a nation, was coming through, they wanted to take 10 minutes to look at this, and suddenly, 45 minutes later, they're still playing with the walls or the, or the things, you know, it really engages them, yeah. It's a secret, isn't it? You know, when you say, we go. only need 10 minutes of time, and then when 45 minutes have gone past, you know someone is really interested. If they stay for three, you know perhaps yeah. they're not as engaged as they might be. Oh, Bob, what a pleasure. This, think about this, the pharmacy, schools, colleges, faculties around the world, tend to be amongst the smallest academic units on any university campus. But suddenly, you're a center of activity and excitement. And that's really important because pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences, okay, I keep saying, we haven't seen the best yet. Just mm. wait for all the things that are coming. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bob, I have to say back to you that um, our community pharmacy section were writing their vision uh, at the end of last year, beginning of this year. And the way in which community pharmacy has stepped up and been a real visible uh, emblematic um, supply function during the COVID time, essential in every nation, does a little bit of what you've just said there. Our profession is very much like the grout behind the tiles on the wall. It's not often seen, but when it becomes visible, it's super exciting for the profession and ensures that we are seen as important. 
And I agree with you, we are uh, not as small as we might be seen in um, faculty terms. Yeah. Perfect. Mm, we have much to talk about, Bob. Um, our next question then is about things that we're most proud of. And again, you have a lot of fellowships, a lot of awards, um, numerous recognition points, and I don't even think they touch the surface. I think you are deserved of many more. Elected Fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, a Fellow of FIP, a Chair of our Global Pharmaceutical Observatory Advisory Board, part-time president of the Global Drug Commercialization Center, um, part-time VP of that center worldwide, member of the External Advisory Board of Trinity College Dublin. Um, coming to you personally, or maybe with the help of Arlene or one of the children, what are the three things that you are most proud of? Well, uh, all three are going to be different, I think, as I, I think about it more. The first thing, and I hope you will allow me to say this, is actually one of the things I'm most proud of is my family and my children. All three of our leans and my children are grown up, their parents themselves. They're accomplished, they're bright, they're inquisitive. They don't quit until the challenge has been met. But you know, more importantly, all three of them are caring and empathetic. And in today's world, I think that is so important. They all volunteer their time and effort to help others who are more challenged and less fortunate than themselves. They're wonderful human beings and all of them have traveled to different parts of the world to do these things. And I know that they will raise our, uh, their children, our six grandchildren with similar values. And I think that's important. And they learned some of that from both of what their mother and I have done professionally in our life, but what has become a part of our life beyond just simply the office or the laboratory or the classroom. And I think that's, I'm really proud of that for them. Professionally, we could talk about all sorts of things. I could talk about my research. I wasn't the greatest researcher, but I loved it. Um, despite the fact that when I was first got that chemistry set and started reading all that or started doing that research when I was a freshman at the university, I thought, boy, I'll win certainly a Nobel Prize by the time I'm 50. That certainly hasn't happened and, and never would. But I really enjoyed the research I did around the novel natural products as leads for immune modulatory drugs. And a lot of what I'm asked about now with COVID came out of those things that I learned to get ready for that research. Or I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, get involved with computer-aided drug design back in the early 80s when it was a, a novelty. It was new. There wasn't all these things that you could just buy. You had to make them yourselves. And that was fantastic. I met some of the true luminary figures in that area as that field was just starting to, to become uh, important. Uh, spent a lot of time with biotechnology. But if I might, I think maybe the second thing I'm most proud of is the fact that uh, I'd list uh, uh, receiving the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy Teacher of the Year Award upon the graduation of the very first pharmacy entering class that I ever had the privilege to teach. And that was a real honor. And it meant that I actually could do something important for others beyond just the things that I love, like research, but really in teaching. And I've stayed close to a number of those students and have received other teaching awards since. But that first time in that very first class I taught when they graduated was important. And then I think maybe the third thing in looking at things that are really different is something I've talked to you about, and that's more recently uh, our work that we're doing in Ethiopia. About two years ago, I was asked to help two colleagues one who was born in Ethiopia and was passionate to contribute something back to his birth nation, and another that wanted to do genomics in Africa and Ethiopia, and he was a long distance runner and just loved reading about and learning about these great Ethiopian marathon runners that would win uh, uh, gold medals at the Olympics and things. And so they both had ideas of projects they wanted to do in Ethiopia. Uh, they approached me and asked, uh, could I maybe help them design a plan to engage Ethiopia, whatever that really entailed or meant, and how they could take the things they were interested in do that. And spent uh, uh, time with them really talking uh, to them and talking about not doing a project, but how do you, you know, their individual interests, but how do you take those and do something that becomes more important, more impactful? And then we spent a great deal of time with a whole group of uh, significant uh, and key uh, thought leaders and decision leaders in Ethiopia 
Uh, these were university officials, government officials, uh, uh, people in the, in the private sector in Ethiopia and, and so on. And to be honest, that, in the, er, that endeavor, the things they had an interest in changed from individual projects to building a new global partnership model that can really deliver success, we think, and be scalable and transferable. We're working with Ethiopians for Ethiopians to create change through research and learning and engagement. The drivers are this new partnership are good science, good learning, good entrepreneurship, and good policy. We use the health ecosystem as our living laboratory. And one of the great, greatest values of that is it's the greatest intersection of government, the private sector, academic institutions, international organizations, and the average person. It's also an ecosystem that tends to be measured a lot and one judges the success of a nation, of an area, of a region, of a country, okay, by how well they do within health and well-being of their population. Uh, the uh, endeavor is called the Ethiopian Translational Health Inno er, Innovation, and it's now a model for what UBC is building as the new international strategy, emphasizing impact and not activities. And we've been really proud of it in, in uh, starting to attract interest from major foundations and organizations around the world. So that's been exciting, but three distinctly different things that I'd say uh, to the group I'm proud of. I think this, Bob, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We should be very, very proud of our family, not just um, children, but heritage, because this really grounds us, doesn't it? And really provides us with some stability and some forward thinking. So I'm really pleased that you mentioned your family there. What I see is a key set of themes here with your family, your teaching and research career, um, including that first award, Awards are so important, aren't they? And then the Ethiopian project is, again, some of the traits that we saw in your um, achievements response around setting the scene, finding those um, overlaps, uh, seeing the sum of the parts as greater than the sum itself, and leaving more behind you than you take on the journey. Um, there is some luck with some of those projects, like the Ethiopian project, being in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people at the right time, but it's all down to um, having the right values and the right experiences to be able to make those happen. And I'm not surprised you're proud of your family. They sound like great children um, and a great testament to you and Arlene. Very, very proud of them, I would be. Uh, well, but I see you. a lot of similarities, Bob, in your, in your responses. Um, it's very interesting and how funny that you've come back to the achievement one about the Ethiopian experience about impact not activities helping the international profile of the faculty is a real synergy there it's wonderful it's wonderful oh, and if it's purposeful it, it's wonderful to read and see <laughs> thank you um, you're, you're an ease to interview let me tell you um, so Bob I mentioned at the start how important it is for us to reflect not only on the things that have gone well, but some of the things we've learned about along the way. And you've described some tough situations that you've had to handle. If you were, it's not necessarily for Bob um, as a young uh, scientist way back in the day, but if you were to give three top tips to the next generation, what would they be? Well, I've thought about this a lot. And I will say uh, these three are things I have told people that I have mentored, uh, colleagues that have wanted to go uh, into administration, uh, students that are looking for those next great opportunities and what can they do. And so uh, there are things I think about a lot. One would be, do make sure that you establish early in your career, your moral and ethical compass. By that, I mean your tool set that you'll use in reference to your ability to judge what is right and what is wrong and act accordingly in all of your professional decisions that you're gonna make and all the professional actions that you take. Always stay true to yourself in that compass. The second I would say is you're going to make mistakes. I certainly made a lot of them in my career. Own both your successes as well as your failures. Learn from your mistakes, take responsibility for them, and make sure you're a critical part of the solution to correct those mistakes. And the third thing is it doesn't take a genius to know this. Okay, but that is, it is often more important to listen more than to talk more. And you've unfortunately got me talking more, but short of that, I think it's still a good uh, thing to think about for the 
uh, the future generations. Well, Bob, it's not often that uh, somebody speaks more than me, and I think that's a very, very good lesson for me to learn as well. You have two ears and one mouth, and I think that's the ratio that we're supposed to use them in, I've heard. Um, such good top tips do make sure about your moral compass and I think when I was reflecting on your three things you're most proud of they're all influenced by moral and ethical compass that was one of the things you said you're super proud of your children for having such good values and uh, I think to set it when you're young really helps you navigate your way through life not wanting to stretch the analogy um, and I really like that one about you will make mistakes so own your successes and your failures learn from them don't let them um, cripple your, your progress, but learn from them. See what you could have done better. Um, it's, yeah, it's super advice. Thank you so much. Well, I'm noting them down you. as well. <laughs> I'm hardly the next generation, but I'm hoping that they will hold me in good stead. So, Bob, finally, uh, we're at the um, final question now. End our interview and gain even more insight into your tips and tricks for how um, Bob Sintelard ticks. We've all had to change our habits and our ways of working during these very strange times that we're living in. What have you found the three essentials to be in your working life during COVID-19? Okay, well, uh, hopefully these have some value. I, I do have thought of them often uh, in my life and during my career, but I think they're uh, even more important now. One is to make every moment count. Life is too short and goes by faster than we ever think. So truly make every moment count. The second is, I think, uh, you, you really, whatever you're doing and wherever your passion is and whatever you, your, your career is and, and those things that drive you, okay, you want to shape a better world. If you're not in, but if you're not enjoying what you're doing, if you're not enjoying your role, no matter how challenging, then you're in the wrong line of work and you need to give that some thought. And I think that's, there's such challenges now but hopefully, even if you're really embedded in some of the most challenging parts of our community, our world, okay, where COVID is, is most a problem, and even though it must be just a tremendous challenge and burden to you, hopefully at some point you get to sit down and think about, wow, look at how I made a difference. And hopefully you enjoy that, because if you don't find any enjoyment out of any of that, you're in the wrong place. The third one is if I can borrow a Latin phrase, and it's again, nothing clever, but it's carpe diem, meaning seize the day. And that's really true, especially at times like this. Have confidence in your knowledge and skills and have the courage to put them to good use where they are needed most. And so that might be kind of a good way to pull all this together. It's wonderful, it really is. From the boy who found the beakers in the basement, and headed off to Rexall Drugstore to buy your chemicals and even thought, even when you, your mum even thought that you were smoking in the basement. That's just hilarious. That stuck with me so much. Um, all the way through to those honours and um, achievements that you've had and the things that you're most proud of, your family, the career and the Ethiopian project. I'm really, really happy to see the making every moment count find enjoyment in what you do and carpe diem as your three essentials Bob all listed down all noted and the golden thread that uh, kind of seems to go all the way through this is this um, being grounded by values and by clear judgment Bob what a pleasure that has been just a wonderful time to spend with you um, it's been an interesting uh, uh, time to reflect a little bit on these things because we don't necessarily sit down and do that but one also needs to reflect on the fact that whatever I talked about and whatever I've been able to be part of, I truly have really only been a part of that. These things only happen uh, with a group, with a team. And in many ways, I've been very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time with all the right people. And uh, uh, I'm probably as pleased that uh, since I've uh, stepped out of the deanship position, the faculty has is, is become even better and is doing even more things. And it's well beyond anything I've done. It's, it's the concept of being part of something that continues on. And it's the, uh, you know, the uh, joy and, and uh, uh, blessing of, uh, of beating Arlene and the wonderful family and everything just kind of tying together. And I always thought, boy, you know, I'm a lucky guy. Uh, how could I have anything better than what this is? 
I will say maybe in closing that uh, when I was offered the job as Dean at the University of British Columbia, Arlene said to me, do you sure you really wanna take this? You really like doing all those other things. Do you wanna do this? You always worry about everything. You always get so involved in things. Do you wanna do that? And I said, well, I think I do. And she said, well, I'll only agree to do that and move to Vancouver if you promise that every day when we come home, you're gonna say you had a great day and not complain about something going wrong or all the challenges or whatever. And uh, that really puts it in perspective. And I will say there was one day, she a, was a professor in history at the University of British Columbia as I was there as Dean. And I picked her up from the office one night and Vancouver in the middle of the summer has these beautiful twilight sunsets. At 10 p.m. it still has a little bit of light. And, and I truly had a bad day. I won't go into it, but it was just really one of the most challenging days in my, my career. And I picked her up and she said, so did you have a good day, which she asked me every day. And my answer was supposed to be yes. And I said, you know, honestly, no, I can't think of a single good thing. And she had me drive down by the beach and look out at that sunset in Vancouver. And she said, now tell me you haven't had a good day. And doesn't that put everything into perspective, right? And so I hope all that are in our profession, uh, in the disciplines that we uh, embrace in pharmaceutical sciences, the healthcare workers that are going through all the challenges they are today, that they find joy and excitement and passion in every day, uh, things that they do, so. That's just a wonderful note to finish this on. May they all find their beautiful sunset at the end of a very hard day, Bob. What a wonderful way to finish our interview. This has been a pleasure and an honor, and I wish you well. Be safe, keep well, and we will see each other soon. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you, Bob. Thanks a million. Bye-bye.